Nice. Yeah, here we go. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today starts a very special week. We are highlighting Mastering Diabetes. What is Mastering Diabetes? Well, it's not only a wonderful program that was co-founded by today's guest, but it's also a New York Times bestselling book co-authored by today's guest. The other author will be on tomorrow, hint, hint. So today I welcome Cyrus Kambada to the show. He is the co-founder of this wonderful book and program that you're gonna learn so much about. But today what he's gonna focus on are carbs because we all know carbs are bad, right? And it's like, I, I told Cyrus we should call this, you know, if you're not gonna eat a potato, don't even bother watching. <laughs> <laughs> he not only yeah, no. eats carbs, he recommends them to the people in his program who are diabetic, pre-diabetic. He's type one diabetic himself. He's living with them and he eats a lot of carbs. So please welcome to the show, Cyrus. It's so great to have you talk about this because you know I, it drives me crazy because I'm texting you all the time about this when people ask me about it. Yeah, no, Chef AJ, I mean, you're, you're, first of all, thank you for having me and my entire team on for the rest of this week. We're like, we love talking with your audience. I love talking with you. And uh, this is an awesome opportunity. Um, but, you know, this subject of like carbohydrates are the enemy. Carbohydrates are evil. Carbohydrates will make you fat. Carbohydrates will make you more diabetic. Carbohydrates will make you increase your insulin secretion. Carbohydrates will raise your cholesterol. I mean, it's just, it's like the antithesis of science. It is literally, it's not just like pseudoscience, it's anti-science. And that's the thing that bothers me about it, right? But rather than getting frustrated with the way that people talk about carbohydrates, we're gonna add some actual credibility using rigorous evidence-based science, but in a really understandable manner and try and get people to start to think about carbohydrates differently because uh, there's a lot of important nuances, but the overall message is that eating carbohydrates if and only if they are the right type of carbohydrate can dramatically improve your overall health. That's the take home message. So if you remember nothing from this talk, remember that one statement and then we can get into the details here. And we almost need a different name for complex unrefined carbohydrates and right. sugar, flour and alcohol because all, all, you know, it's like Dr. David Katz who's been on the show says there's a big difference between lentils and lollipops. Yeah, right, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a good way to think about it, right? I mean, also, I think one of the things that, that really confuses people is that the term carb and sugar, those two words, carb, sugar, carb, sugar, carb, sugar, they get, they get confused with each other, right? And so when people say things like, oh, I'm on a low carb diet, I think what they're trying to say is I'm trying to reduce my intake of refined carbohydrate rich foods, which is a good thing. Nobody's going to argue with that. Nobody's going to tell you to eat more breads and cereals and pastas and sugar sweetened beverages. Like we know as a scientific community, whether you're paleo or ketogenic or plant-based that refined carbohydrates are not ideal. They increase your risk for many chronic diseases, diabetes being one of them, right? So when people say I'm on a low carb diet, what they truly want to, should be saying is I'm eating a diet with limited refined carbohydrate rich foods. But the counter argument to that is when limiting your refined carbohydrate intake, the right thing to do is actually increase your whole carbohydrate intake that comes from fruits and vegetables and legumes and whole grains. So if you just lived, if you do nothing else, but literally just do that switch where you're eating less refined and more whole, then all of a sudden you're gonna see a dramatic improvement in your overall health your blood glucose is going to become more manageable. Your body weight will probably go down. You'll probably be a happier person. You'll probably go to the bathroom more frequently. You'll probably have more energy. You'll probably sleep better. You'll probably have less anxiety. And the list goes on. Yeah, that's great. Because you know what's happened, Cyrus, is a lot of the doctors that aren't plant-based doctors will tell people to go on a high-fat diet right. to help their diabetes. And there's even a, a well-known TED Talk about it. And that's why people, are, I think, are afraid, especially if they are diabetic. Yes. So <clears throat> the world of, uh, of, of high fat diets is probably stronger in today's world than it's ever been. So if you trace back this idea of eating a high fat diet, it actually started back in like the 1970s with the original Atkins diet. And that kind of became popular for a while, then it went away. Then it came back again in the 1990s and became like one of the biggest dietary trends of, of the, that the world had ever seen. Then the low carbohydrate philosophy morphed into like the zone diet and the South beach diet. And then it became the paleo diet. And then it became the ketogenic diet. And now the ketogenic diet is 
the, the most low carb of the low carb diets and the most popular low carb diet of all the low carb diets, right? And the reason why the ketogenic diet has become so popular in my opinion is because the ketogenic diet is an incredibly effective rapid weight loss tool. That's the reason. Okay. So when you eat a ketogenic diet, what you're trying to do is limit your total carbohydrate intake to approximately 30 grams of net carbohydrate per day. Okay. So that means that the total amount of uh, absorbable carbohydrate that you can convert into energy is 30 grams per day at the maximum. And if you do that, then what you force your liver to do is basically say, okay, I'm no longer reliant on glucose from carbohydrates because there just isn't that much to begin with. Therefore, I have to manufacture and create my own new fuel in order to send that fuel up to my brain because your brain runs off of glucose. Your brain is designed to run off of glucose. So when there isn't much glucose available in your diet, then your liver goes, oh, wait a minute, I'm gonna have to make a new fuel. And the new fuel is called ketone bodies. So the term ketone body got converted into keto or ketosis. And as a result of that, this new diet is nicknamed the keto diet or the ketogenic diet, right? So in reality, what happens is that when you limit your total carbohydrate intake to 30 grams of net carb per day, then you force your liver to start manufacturing a backup fuel for your brain. And this backup fuel called ketone bodies are, they have some benefits for, for neurological function. There's no question about it. Um, and they also have some benefits for other tissue function, okay? But before we go into the benefits here of the ketogenic, uh, you know, of, the, of ketone bodies, the one thing that's very important to understand is that when you transition to a ketogenic diet, most people experience not only weight loss, but rapid weight loss. When I talk about rapid weight loss, I mean, in the first month of adopting a ketogenic diet, sometimes you see people losing something like 15 to 20 pounds of weight, just like literally just melts right off of them. And then sustained over the longer period of time, they end up losing somewhere between one to three pounds of body weight per week, every single week for like six months. So you do the math on that, right? If you lose 15 pounds right off the bat, and then you're losing, let's say two pounds per week for many weeks after that, a ketogenic diet then becomes a very attractive weight loss strategy. And so a lot of people gravitate towards that because they're like, oh man, I'm 60 pounds overweight. I'm hundred pounds overweight. I'm 120 pounds overweight. I heard that a ketogenic diet is a great way to lose weight. So then they, they start the ketogenic diet, they lose weight. And all of a sudden they're like, cool, this feels awesome. Right now, in addition to the weight loss benefits, or I should say, as a result of the weight loss, the rapid weight loss, what people also uh, experience is a whole collection of other positive metabolic benefits, including a reduced A1C value, which is a sort of long-term marker of blood glucose control, uh, reduced fasting blood glucose, reduced fasting insulin level, uh, reduced blood pressure. Um, oftentimes they feel more energy and they get better digestion. So they're like, wait a minute, hold on a second, hold on a second. I'm losing weight quickly. My A1C is down. My fasting glucose is down. My fasting insulin is down. My blood pressure is down. My Sometimes their total triglycerides can come down. Their total blood cholesterol can come down. They have more energy and they can digest food better. So they're like, well, this is unbelievable. I think I just found a solution to long-term health, right? And I'm not going to argue with them because all of these, these effects are real and it happens to so many people. But here's the problem, okay? When you're eating a ketogenic diet, there's, a, there's like a thousand different mechanisms as to why a ketogenic diet can create all of these responses. And we could do literally like a week's worth of, tele, of, of live streaming for 24 hours at a time to really go into the biological mechanisms. I'm not gonna bore you guys with that, but understand that when you're consuming a diet that is very high in fat, like 70 to 80% of total calories and very limited in its carbohydrate uh, quantity, there's a whole bunch of different changes, physiological changes that are happening in your brain, inside of your liver, inside of your vasculature, inside of your liver, inside of your kidneys. And as a result of that, you end up with a lot of these positive benefits, okay? So my hat's off to people who do this because they see rapid weight loss and they feel a lot better. That's great. But here's the problem. Over the long term, when you consume a ketogenic diet, especially if that ketogenic diet comes from animal sources like red meat, white meat, chicken, fish, uh, shellfish, poultry, 
uh, what else am I missing here? Eggs, dairy products, okay? When that becomes the bulk of your energy supply, what the research demonstrates is that you get the short-term benefits, but it's mixed with long-term complications. So the short-term benefits happen for like, I don't know, three months, six months, nine months, depending on the individual. And then over the course of time, when weight loss slows down or plateaus, then a lot of those other benefits that came along for the ride start to move in the opposite direction. And within a short period of time, people are like, well, wait a minute, I just lost 50 pounds, which is cool. But now my cholesterol is on its way up. And now my blood pressure is going back up. And now my A1C is creeping up. And now I don't feel that good anymore. And now my digestion is all weird. And now I'm not sleeping well anymore, right? And so you end up with this sort of like, downward progression, plateau, and then all of a sudden you get like a, an upward progression of a lot of these other biomarkers, which can become problematic. So what we see all the time in our coaching program at Mastering Diabetes is that people come to us because they've been doing a low carbohydrate diet for a long time, okay? The low carbohydrate diet could be ketogenic or paleo or Atkins or some version thereof. And a lot of people come to us with this same collection of concerns. I kid you not. It's literally like I can write this down on a piece of paper. And they say, I can't lose weight. I can't lose weight for the life of me anymore. I'm done. Nothing that I do allows me to lose weight. Number two, my fasting blood glucose is elevated. My A1C is higher than it was when I began. My blood pressure is elevated. Now I'm on hypertensive medication. My doctor just gave me a whole collection of diabetes medications, right? And as a result of that, they're all of a sudden, they're just like, well, what happened? Like it was working, but it doesn't work anymore, right? So if you go into the research and you actually try and ask yourself the question, like what, what's happening? Uh, one of the things that you'll find is that when you're eating a, a, a ketogenic diet, that's high in fat, especially if it comes from animal sources, you end up dramatically reducing the ability of blood vessels to, to properly perfuse tissues throughout your body. In other words, you reduce blood flow to tissues. Okay. The blood in your, in, you know, in your cardiovascular system, because has a higher viscosity, which means it's a little bit goopier. It's a little bit, it's harder to flow through vessels. The cholesterol content of your blood increases because there's more cholesterol inside of your food. The fat content of your blood increases because there's more fat content in your food. And as a result of that, you end up with these, uh, these arterial plaque deposits that build up on the inside of blood vessels, which then makes them harder, more atherosclerotic, which then increases the blood pressure. So they become more rigid. And in addition to that, there's more lipid being deposited inside of your muscle tissue, literally inside of your shoulders, your triceps, your biceps, your quadriceps, your abdomen. And when there's more lipid being stored inside of your muscle tissue, then you become insulin resistant, which then increases your need for insulin production. So it's this whole cascade of, of metabolic effects and a lot of it just boils down to what's happening in your vasculature. And once you start to understand that a ketogenic diet can actually negatively harm your vasculature in the long term, then it's, it's a very reasonable explanation to understand why your risk for cancer can go up, your risk for diabetes can go up, your risk for cardiovascular disease can go up, your risk for chronic kidney disease can go up, Alzheimer's disease, fatty liver disease, you name it. Okay, so ketogenic diets in the long term can become very problematic. And that's one of the messages that I want people to really understand is that short-term Band-Aid does not equal long-term sustainable approach. Right, exactly. That's, I love that. And it's like with people that have gastric bypass, but then they don't change their diet. Right. Yep. So Darius, who's watching live says, I need this. I'm still struggling with high blood glucose, even with a whole food plant-based diet. So I get that a lot from people. We tell them to eat the way we eat and then their blood sugar goes up and they say, see, I can't eat carbs. Right. Okay. So this is, this is a great question. So thank you for asking that question, Darius. And I know there's a lot of people who struggle with this problem as well. Okay. So <clears throat> you, you've heard this story before. Maybe you've experienced it yourself where you're eating a high fat diet. You eat a high fat diet and it keeps your blood glucose nice and low, keeps your, uh, your blood pressure nice and low, and it keeps your, your A1C nice and low, okay? Then after doing that for like, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks, a month, three months, you start to feel like you're like, wow, I really wanna eat a potato. I really wanna eat some fruit. I really wanna eat that banana right now, right? So you pick up the banana and you start to eat it. 
And then you eat one banana, which is not that much carbohydrate, but it is a carbohydrate rich food. And an hour later, you don't feel well. You go to check your blood glucose and all of a sudden your blood glucose is now 200. And you step back for a second and you say, well, wait a minute. This entire time I've been eating a high fat diet and a high fat diet has been keeping my blood glucose low. I just ate a banana and my blood glucose went high. So what's the logical conclusion from that experience? Logical conclusion is that bananas equal high blood glucose. You could repeat that experiment. You could do it with a potato. You can do it with a, a bowl of black beans. You can do it with some quinoa. You can do it with some rice. Anytime you take carbohydrate rich food and you put it into, in, into this experiment, what you are likely to find is that your blood glucose goes very high and it doesn't feel good. So what people do is they go, oh, okay, well, I just had some rice. I had a banana, I had a mango and all of a sudden my glucose went high. Well, I guess that further reinforces that I should be eating a low carbohydrate diet. So they continue to avoid carbohydrates and they continue to eat a low carbohydrate diet, okay? Now, from a biochemical perspective, it's very understandable what's happening, okay? When you eat a high fat diet, like I was alluding to earlier, you eat a high fat diet, the, the fatty acids that are present in the food are actually locked up in this molecule called triglyceride. The triglyceride travels down your esophagus, it gets inside of your stomach, it gets inside of your small intestine. And once it's in your small intestine, the triglyceride molecule gets ripped apart and the fatty acids from those triglycerides end up getting into these little, these little spaceships, if you will, these little what are called lipoprotein particles inside of your blood. And these guys circulate all throughout your blood and their, their goal is to try and uh, donate fatty acids to tissues. And it makes perfect sense because you eat triglyceride and now those fatty acids are in your blood and these little chylomicron particles are like, well, hey, I got to go give this stuff to tissues. So under normal circumstances, if, if I had to design the perfect human being, okay, the perfect superhuman, what I would do is I would make sure that those chylomicron particles only deliver fatty acids to your fat tissue. That's it. I would only allow those chylomicrons to put fat inside of your adipose tissue, which is, you know, it's all over the place. It's in your neck. It's in your, it's in your armpits, right? It's in your triceps. It's in your abdomen. It's in your butt. You know what I'm talking about. It's the fat tissue that everybody kind of wants less of, right? The reason why I would put those fatty acids only in that fat tissue is because that fat tissue is a safe place from a, from a mechanical and enzymatic place from a perspective to keep all that fatty acids, okay? But here's the problem. Those chylomicron particles, they deliver fatty acids to your adipose tissue. But in addition to that, they also deliver those fatty acids to your muscle. It also goes to your liver, okay? So when you're eating a high fat diet, you eat triglycerides for breakfast and lunch and dinner, and you repeat that tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. And every time you do that, there's multiple tissues that receive those fatty acids. Again, they go inside of your fat tissue, which is fine, but then they also go inside of your muscle and they go inside of your liver. Now, your muscle and liver can store about this much fatty acid. They're, they're biologically designed to store very small amounts of fatty acid. So when you're consuming a high fat diet, within a short period of time, the amount of lipid or fatty acids inside of those tissues starts to increase and increase and increase and increase and increase. And before you know it, you've now overloaded your muscle and liver with too much fatty acids. So if you are your liver or muscle tissue, what your liver and muscles are saying, well, wait a minute, where did all these fatty acids come from? I didn't ask for this stuff. I can only store this much. And yet you're giving me this much. I don't know what to do, right? So these, the liver and muscle don't have a choice. They have to sort of take this stuff up and they take it up and they store it and they store it and they store it and they store it and they store it. And at a certain point, they get overwhelmed and they're like, oh, God, we got to stop this stuff from coming in. We got to mount some kind of self-defense mechanism here because this is too much. So what they do is they create a thing called insulin resistance. They make themselves resistant to insulin because insulin is the most powerful way to get more energy inside of a tissue. So if you're inside of your liver or you're inside of your muscle and you're like, hey, I want to block more energy from coming in, what you do is you just basically stop paying attention to insulin. So when insulin comes and goes, knock, knock, there's some stuff in the blood. There's some glucose in the blood. Do you want to take it up? You can basically say, no, 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 no. I already have a whole Costco warehouse full of fatty acids in here. I'm not interested. Go away. 
So that's what happens. Your liver and muscle basically mount a, a war, if you will, or mount, create a wall against insulin so that when insulin goes knock, 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 I got some glucose in the blood because Darius just ate a banana. Your liver and muscle go, no, 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 no. It's not banana time. It's fatty acid time. I got to burn this stuff first. So what ends up happening is that the, the carbohydrate, the energy that you consumed in the banana or the plate of rice or the quinoa or the bowl of raisins, that stuff gets trapped in your blood, okay? So the glucose is literally trapped inside of your blood because it can't get into your liver. It can't get into your muscle tissue. And as a result of that, you check your blood glucose an hour later and you're like, huh, my glucose is super high, right? So if you know, now that you know the basic biochemistry here, if we want to go backwards and try and solve this problem, we have to ask ourselves a simple question. What caused the problem? Was it the banana that caused the problem? Or was there something else before the banana that actually created the insulin resistant state? And if you go backwards, what you'll find out is that all the fatty acid rich foods that you ate before, the chicken, the meat, the dairy products, the oils, uh, the avocados, the nuts, the seeds, okay? All of those foods are contributing towards this deposition of more fat inside of your muscle and inside of your liver. And as soon as you reduce the amount of total fatty acids that you're consuming in your diet, then you relieve the pressure on those tissues and those tissues can then start to respond to insulin once again. So really what we're trying to do is, is, is make a really simple argument here, which is that when you consume fat rich foods, you become insulin resistant quickly. When you are insulin resistant, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to consume carbohydrates without your blood glucose going up. So if you really wanna be able to consume carbohydrate rich food and have fruits and vegetables and legumes and whole grains like I'm suggesting, then you need to have to must first reduce the total fat content in your diet. And when you do that, then all of a sudden carbohydrate metabolism turns back on again. And now you can metabolize large numbers of carbohydrate and your blood glucose stays nice and stable. So if I understand you correctly, it's it, the carbs or the complex carbs are only a problem for diabetics if it's still in an environment of, of high fat. And what is high fat that can actually even be controversial. So what yes. do you recommend is the total amount of fat somebody trying to manage their diabetes or reverse their insulin resistance be on your program? That's exactly right. So you're absolutely right in the sense that uh, you can't really consume carbohydrate if you are in an insulin resistant state. So the question is, well, how do I know if I'm insulin resistant? How much fat can I have in my diet? Just like you're saying. And the answer is very straightforward. If you're consuming approximately 10 to 15% of all of your calories in the form of fat, then you're going to be likely very insulin sensitive. If your total fat intake exceeds 15% of all the calories that you put in your mouth, then you're likely to become more and more insulin resistant over time. Okay. So really the, the magic number, just think of the number 15, 15% or less of your total calories from fat is ideally where you want to be. And if you want to do it on a gram basis, then you can basically say approximately 30 grams of fat per day. That's a, It's an easier way to think about it. Okay approximately 30 grams of fat per day for your sort of like quote unquote normal average person is the, the, is the cutoff. If you can try and keep your fat intake just below 30 grams of fat per day, then you are maximizing your insulin sensitivity and trying to avoid this problem of having high blood glucose that's hard to control. Right. See, because I think people want the proverbial cake and eat it too. They want to be able sure. to eat a lot of carbs, but they still want to put peanut sauce on their sweet potatoes and, and they don't always go together. So Alexa says, well, not all diabetics who can eat carbs, who have other autoimmune or endocrine or liver disorders can handle that much carbohydrate. What do you say to that? Because you, you have type one diabetes and you eat lots of carbs. At first I thought when you were talking about Alexa, I thought you were talking about like the Amazon Alexa. <laughs> She's in the other room because when I've, when I've done cooking demos, she starts talking if you say her name. <laughs> okay. So remind me, what did, what did Alexa the human actually say? So she's saying, because we're talking about being able to eat a lot of carbs, and she says not all diabetics who also have other autoimmune, endocrine, or liver disease can handle much carbs. Okay. So again, if you're operating in an insulin resistant state, if your fat intake is exceeds 15% of your total calories, then you are absolutely right, Alexa. It is going to be very challenging to eat carbohydrate rich food. And what I suggest to you is to do a two step process. Number one, a three-step process, three-step process. Number one, 
log the food that you're eating on a daily basis. Literally pick up your phone, download an app called Chronometer or My Fitness Pal or any number of different fitness apps where you can actually say, I ate this, I ate this, I ate this. And you literally, I want you to log your food for a three day period. Okay. Once you log your food for a three day period, then you will get insights from the app and it'll basically say, Hey, Alexa, did you know that your average carbohydrate intake is something like 55% of total calories? Did you know that you're consuming approximately 30% of your total uh, food, uh, your total calories in fat and so on and so forth. Right? So what I want you to pay attention to is what percent of your typical daily food is fat. Okay. That's the first thing I want you to pay attention to. Now, once you know that number, let's just say that you logged your food for three days and you got the number and the number was 25%. Okay. The second thing that I want you to do is identify the foods that are high in fat. Okay. And these are usually foods. If you're eating an omnivorous diet, they're going to be red meat and white meat. They're going to be dairy products and they're going to be uh, uh, fish. Okay. Those are four sources of sat saturated fat in particular. And then the curveball for most people is oil. Olive oil, MCT oil, coconut oil, uh, rice bran oil, canola oil, any version of oil is going to be very problematic. And Chef AJ, you know this better than anybody else in the world because oil is very calorie dense and can be very problematic for weight loss. But in addition to that, it also adds a significant amount of fat to your diet. Okay. So I want you to identify all the fat rich foods that are present in your baseline diet. Then what I want you to do is reduce those baseline fat foods to drop your total calorie intake from fat to less than 15%. Now, once you've done that steps one and steps two, then, and only then can you take step three and step three is to start increasing your intake of whole carbohydrate rich foods from all fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains. Okay. The only way that you can increase your carbohydrate intake from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes is to first do steps one and two. But if you haven't done step one and you don't know what your total fat content is, and you haven't done step two and reduced it to less than 15%, then you're going to have the same conclusion that Darius had. You're going to have the same conclusion that most people in the ketogenic world have, which is I can't eat carbohydrates because when I do, it makes me feel junky and I have low energy and my digestion is impaired and uh, my blood glucose goes through the roof. Okay. But most likely, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Most likely you haven't done steps one and two. So I would encourage you to do both of those first. And then when you do step three becomes an inevitable conclusion that leads to a much better experience. Yeah. Stephen made a great comment. If your sink overflows, don't blame the water. It's the grease that's clogging the drain. Correct. Yeah. It's sort of like when people get E. coli from spinach, but it's not from the spinach. It's from the manure that the spinach was grown in. That's it's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. It, it's very easy to blame the food because the food is something tangible and the food is basically just a messenger. So it's very easy to blame, you know, a potato or a mango and be like, Oh, darn you, you're, you're making me feel bad. But in reality, what you have to do is go backwards and say, well, what's clogging my sink right now? What's causing this insulin resistance traffic jam inside of my liver and muscles. And once you figure out exactly what that is and reduce your total fat intake, then all of a sudden you can start to eat those carbohydrate rich foods without, without any issues. Right. You know, you, obviously you have a PhD in nutritional biochemistry. Most of us don't. So even though you explain this to me many times, it still makes my head spin. I wish there was almost an even more for dummies version because Lauren makes this comment, high fat diet, won't that add to the diabetic issue of obesity? When okay. People... So is a high fat diet going to contribute to obesity is the question, correct? Yeah. And even diabetes. Because... And even diabetes. Yes. The answer is Absolutely. That is absolutely a true statement. Okay. Now I have to be sort of a little bit, I have to like put one caveat here into this statement, which is that, uh, as you know, there's a lot of biodiversity from individual to individual. So chef AJ is female. She might be two years older than me. She has a different body weight than me. Uh, and she has a different activity level than me. Okay. Um, therefore chef AJ has a particular set of influences, which are going to affect her body. And those could be slightly different than what's affecting my body. Okay. And they could be slightly different than what's affecting any of you who are listening to this, your body, right. Depending on your age, your weight, your disease status, your sex, your activity level, how much sleep you get, how much alcohol you drink. Do you smoke cigarettes? Yes or no. 
Okay. So all of these things matter. They absolutely matter. Okay. But as a general rule of thumb, people who eat more plants in their diet, people who, who increase their total plant intake on a daily basis and try and eat something like 60, 70, 80, maybe a hundred percent of their foods from plants end up with number one, the least amount of disease. The more plants you eat, the lower your chronic disease risk for cancer, diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune disease, fatty liver disease, Alzheimer's disease, chronic kidney disease, and the list goes on. Okay. So number one, the more plants you eat, the lower your chronic disease risk. Number two, the more plants you eat, the larger your longevity, the, the higher your longevity. Okay. We have plenty of research to demonstrate that people who consume more fat in their diet, more animal fat in particular, have more mortality from chronic diseases. In other words, they have more chronic disease and they die earlier. So my goal is to try and educate you guys about ways that you can, number one, become less diabetic, number two, become less uh, hypertensive, number three, reduce your cholesterol, number four, reduce your risk for atherosclerosis, number five, have less autoimmune disease, have less obesity, and live a normal, uh, you know, live in the healthiest manner possible. And one of the most, the, the simplest and most effective ways that you can do that, according to the evidence-based research is literally to increase your plant intake and at the same time, lower your total fat intake. And if you do just the two of those, then all of a sudden chronic disease becomes kind of a thing of the past. And it doesn't really have to get that much more complicated than this. Nice. Well, Alexa saying carbs feed mycoplasmas, fungi, virus, and bacteria and parasites. Uh, not necessarily a true statement. That is not a true statement. Um, so again, we have to, when we use the word carb, we, we cannot just use a blanket term carb. Okay. This is, it's, it's a dangerous game to play rather than saying carbs cause mycobacteria, carbs cause autoimmune disease, carbs cause cancer. Like we, we have to get away from these statements. Instead, what I would encourage you to do is I would say, number one, refined carbohydrates, refined sugars. Okay. These are carbohydrates that started out as a whole food like corn or, uh, what's another example? Um, beets. Okay. And then got refined into a crystal called sugar. Okay. Or got refined into a liquid called high fructose corn syrup. Okay. The, the, what I'm encouraging you to do is eat the whole food and not the, the byproduct, the refined byproduct of it. Okay. When you consume the refined byproducts of whole foods, such as sugar or artificial sweeteners or uh, high fructose corn syrup, then those can dramatically increase your chronic disease risk. And there's plenty of evidence to show that people who consume more sugar sweetened beverages have higher risk for fatty liver disease, more insulin resistance, more cardiovascular disease and uh, a significantly increased risk for autoimmune disease. We know this, there's no, there's no debating this anymore, right? The question is, does the same situation apply to people who eat more fruit? Does the same situation apply to people who eat more potatoes? Okay, and the truth is that the answer is no. If you consume more whole carbohydrates from fruits, potatoes, I'm sorry, fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains, then what you'll find is that the studies back up the, that, the more of those foods you eat, the lower your risk for fatty liver disease, insulin resistance, carbo uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, and autoimmune disease, okay? So what I'm suggesting you do is do two things. Number one, slightly modify your vocabulary. Rather than say carbs cause blank, say refined carbohydrates can increase your risk for a number of diseases, but whole carbohydrates reduce your risk for chronic disease, period, end of story. And then number two, make the switch yourself. Rather than just talking about it, make the switch and lower or eliminate your intake of refined carbohydrates and increase your intake of whole carbohydrates. And when you do that, and you do that slowly and systematically and over the course of time, you're likely to feel dramatically different and you'll see the results in your blood glucose, in your body weight, your blood pressure, and your cholesterol and beyond. Nice. Okay, I saw uh, an interesting question from Bella about carbs, sorry. That's the word that we all are using though, because we haven't learned to separate them. She Good. says, We're change can it. one get diabetes with too much complex carbohydrates? Nope. Impossible. It's impossible. Okay. The, the only way that you could develop 
diabetes from eating too much complex carbohydrate is actually, let me back up, let me back up. The way that you develop prediabetes and type two diabetes is by first developing what's called insulin resistance. Like we talked about inside of your liver and muscle. If you are insulin resistant, then you can become pre-diabetic and then that can manifest into type two diabetes down the road. Okay. So it turns out that pre-diabetes and type two diabetes and gestational diabetes, all three of those are reversible conditions. So you first become insulin resistant and then you can move towards those conditions. But even if you have those conditions, you can then move backwards towards being non-diabetic. And that's what we do. That's exactly what we do here at Mastering Diabetes. And we're very good at it. Okay. And we're very good at it because we follow the science. It's just that simple. Now, the only way that you could actually develop diabetes and have a low fat plant-based whole food diet not benefit you is if your, what's called your C-peptide level is low. Your C-peptide is basically just a measurement of how much insulin your pancreas is or isn't making, okay? So without getting too complicated here, if your C-peptide level is low, what that means is that your pancreas is basically burned out and your pancreas cannot secrete a sufficient amount of insulin anymore. And it's relatively, it's non-reversible for the most part. So if your C-peptide level is low and then you start to eat more carbohydrates, your glucose will go through the roof, okay? So another thing to, to take into account here is if you are eating a low-fat plant-based whole food diet the way I suggest or the way Chef AJ suggests and your blood glucose is still high, and I'm talking like high, 160, 180, 200, 250, 300 consistently, then go get your C-peptide level checked. And when you do, if your C-peptide level is low, then that's kind of a, a sort of like a knockout that basically means like, well, carbohydrates may not be possible for you unless you inject insulin, okay? So it's a long-winded way of me saying in, in the overwhelming majority of all cases, 95 plus percent of all cases, when you eat a significant quantity of whole carbohydrates, uh, your health will improve dramatically and your risk for diabetes will go out the door. We have a comment saying that Mike Cyrus, my 56 year old husband was diagnosed with type one diabetes, was very ill. Your program is literally saving his life. He's a radar engineer. So your book and the science behind it really resonates. He's already doing better and it's only been two weeks on your protocol. Thank you to you and Robbie with a big heart. Unbelievable. I love this. I love this. What was this gentleman's name? Well, I don't know the gentleman's name, but the, the, uh, the name of the person posting is the crafty and that a Napolitan. Maybe they're from Annapolis. I don't know. The crafty. Can, can I share my screen with you? Chef AJ? Yeah. Let me, let me just enable it right here. There we okay. go. I want to share my screen here to show you guys what real people are saying about their results when they listen to this methodology and when they actually apply it. So Denise right here. Four months ago, I found out that my A1C was 12.3, which is very high. And my blood glucose was 525, which is five times higher than it's supposed to be. It really scared me. When the lab technician called me, I immediately started eating vegan. I had my blood work done today and my A1C is now 6.5, which is very good. And my blood glucose was 140 and I have lost 60 pounds. This has saved my life. Okay. So that's, that's just one example of you know, what, what some people have told us. Valerie, I'm pre-diabetic and have been having the hardest time staying on track. And I finally decided to purchase the Mastering Diabetes Meal Planner to help with ideas and recipes. Holy moly. I've lost eight pounds in two weeks. And so far, I love all the recipes. My blood pressure was 147 over 89. And now it's 133 over 81 in two weeks. That's how fast it can change. This is crazy, but I, I, it's amazing, right? So we see these types of you know um, testimonials from people. We get them on a daily basis. Every single day, people are writing to us and they're saying like, I don't understand why this is benefiting me so much, but it, what I, I keep on telling people, I'm like, it is just science. I do not consider myself to be, you know, like having any, you know, I, I shouldn't be given the Nobel prize by any stretch of the imagination for like coming up with new knowledge. I'm literally just a messenger communicating what the scientific community has already discovered. And when you put that information into play, you end up with results like this that basically say, okay, my A1C is coming down. I'm losing weight. I feel like a million bucks. This is really cool, right? So it just, it happens over and over again. And it's, it's really exciting to watch it. Yeah. Do you think that, because a couple of people are saying, well, when they went whole food plant-based, their A1C went up or their blood sugar went up. Do you think that it's possible that they really aren't doing the low fat diet that you recommend? Because people are saying, well, what is 15% of calories from fats? And does that include nut seeds and avocado or just oil? 
fat is so calorically dense. It's easy to get those 30 grams with just a very small amount. That's absolutely right. You, you nailed it on the head. So if you're eating a low fat plant, I'm sorry, if you're eating a, a plant-based diet and you find that your blood glucose is going up, uh, one of two things is, is happening most likely. Number one, just like Chef AJ said, either you're not low fat enough. So use a diet logging app. It's, it's kind of a pain in the app, in a butt and I'm not going to lie, right? I don't love logging my food. I, I don't enjoy it. It's not fun. It's not glamorous. It's not sexy by any stretch of the imagination, but you learn a lot of information from it. So all I'm asking you to do is log your food for three days. That's it. A very short blip on the radar in terms of like overall, you know, time on this planet. So log your food for three days, learn from that information, analyze that information and figure out how much total fat am I consuming? Okay. Your goal is to get your total fat intake to 30 grams per day or less. If you can do that, then you're going to maximize your chances of, you know, having ideal blood glucose. Okay. So that's the first thing. Number two, if your blood glucose is elevated, I'm sorry, if your if your total fat intake is beyond 30 grams of fat per day, don't judge yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Just say, you know what? I got a little bit of work to do. Let me try and minimize my intake of avocados and nuts and seeds. Maybe get rid of the oil. Maybe try and get rid of some of the coconuts that are in there, right? And find ways to pull out a little bit of fat here and there and here and there and bring that fat content to less than 30 grams per day. It's very simple, okay? Once you do that, then your blood glucose should absolutely become uh, significantly more controllable, okay? So that's scenario number one. Scenario number two is like I mentioned before, if you're eating carbohydrate-rich food and your blood glucose goes like alarmingly high, I'm talking 160 or beyond, that's an indicator that your C-peptide level is too low. Then I would go straight to your doctor and I would say, hey, doctor, help me understand what is my C-peptide level. And if you can get your C-peptide measured, get the results back, by all means, send it to our team at team at masteringdiabetes.org and we can help you interpret what the biological significance of that is and then get you uh, the help that you're looking for. That's great. Thank you. So uh, B DV says, if I eat beans, my blood sugar goes through the roof. Why? I'm not diabetic. If I eat beans, my blood sugar goes through the roof. Why? I'm not, okay. So again, we're gonna have to go back to basics here. Uh, I gotta know what the total fat content of your diet is. I gotta know what you're eating. I have to know that information. Yeah. It's impossible for me to answer this question without knowing what right. other things you're eating. So that's the first thing. Uh, secondarily, there are, so, so in my situation, I'm very similar um, in that if I have black beans, my blood glucose goes, goes quite high. If I have garbanzo beans, my blood glucose is rock solid. Okay, so there's very specific types of foods that individuals have uh, an intolerance for. And the intolerance can be due to your microbiome diversity. It could be due to, you know, the, the ability of your liver and pancreas to secrete the right digestive enzymes at the right time. Okay. So in other words, there's bioindividuality between me and chef AJ and you, and some people are likely you're probably intolerant to certain foods, but before jumping to that conclusion, we got to figure out what's the total fat content of the rest of the food that you're eating. And if you can lower that and then retry the experiment with black beans and your blood glucose is stable, then that's fantastic. But if every single time, if you've done that, and every single time you eat black beans, your blood glucose goes, goes through the roof, then that could be an indicator that you're just literally intolerant to that food. And that might be something you want to eliminate or reduce significantly. Great. Thank you. So Lauren's saying in the show notes, it says you're type one diabetic, but she'd like to know your personal story with diabetes. Perfect. Okay. So I was diagnosed with type one diabetes when I was 22. So was, it's a late diagnosis. Most people are diagnosed with type one diabetes when they're like five or eight. Okay, so I was diagnosed at 22. I was a senior at Stanford University, just trying to graduate and move on with my life. And uh, I actually got diagnosed with three autoimmune conditions. So type one diabetes, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. So like low thyroid hormone output. And then number three is called alopecia, which is why, as you can see, I have no hair. I have no eyebrows. I got no eyelashes, no ear hair, nose hair, nothing. Okay? You must save a lot of money on beauty care products. Oh, it's unbelievable. I can, I can literally take a shower in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> All I need to do is put a little bit of soap on me and I'm done, right? No shampoo, no haircutting, no shaving, nothing. It's great. That's awesome. Okay. So I was diagnosed with three autoimmune conditions when I was 22. Then I tried the low carbohydrate diet for the first year. It was supposed to make my blood glucose controllable and keep my insulin use nice and low. It didn't do that. My blood glucose was, was very hard to control. My insulin use was creeping up from like 25 to 30 to 32 to 36 to 39 to 42 to 47 to 55 units a day. And in addition to that, I couldn't exercise frequently and I love exercise. So I switched over to eating a plant-based diet because I just wanted to feel better. 
And in the process of doing that, I felt so much better. My blood glucose became way more controllable. My insulin use came down back towards 25 units a day. I could sleep better. I was more hydrated. I could play sports more frequently. I could play harder. I could recover faster. And I literally just felt like a million bucks. So I went back to graduate school and I studied for five years at UC Berkeley. I got a PhD in nutritional biochemistry. And while I was there, I was able to learn the true evidence-based science behind all this, this whole dietary philosophy. And in the process of doing that, I then created Mastering Diabetes along with my co-founder, Robbie Barbero, who also has type one. And the two of us have been able to educate at this point. We don't really know the number, but it's, you know, direct people through our coaching program, greater than 10,000. Overall people that have learned from us, probably greater than a hundred thousand people when we're very proud of that. And, you know, we see this over and over again, where we're trying to educate people about the benefits of a plant-based diet specifically for diabetes. And uh, so far we've gotten, you know, a phenomenal response from people. And our goal is to literally just try and help as many people as possible, because I like going to sleep at night, knowing that other people are healthier as a result of transitioning towards a more plant focused approach. That's amazing. Well, you and Robbie are to diabetes, what Benjamin Franklin is to electricity. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I hope Thank I have my, my historians, right? I always get him and Graham Bell and all those guys mixed up. So <laughs> Let, let's, you know, tell the truth. Does this work for everyone? Because Jennifer's saying it doesn't work for everyone. I became pre-diabetic on a whole food plant-based diet, had genetic testing done at Mayo. I don't process carbs well. I now need plant-based protein powder bars three times a day. Okay. So does this work for everyone? And the answer is no, there's nothing that works for everyone. There's nothing that works for everyone. I don't care whether it's paleo, keto, plant-based, you name it. There's literally no one size fits all prescription for all humanity. It doesn't exist. There's bio-individuality between people. There's no questions asked. People's carbohydrate tolerance is different. So uh, what was the name of the, uh, the, the lady that just wrote? It was Jennifer. Jennifer. Jennifer, thank you. So Jennifer, your carbohydrate tolerance could certainly be different than mine. And again, uh, it's dependent on your age, your sex, your energy level, your disease history, uh, whether you smoke cigarettes, um, whether you drink alcohol, how much sunlight you get, what is your stress level? How much sleep do you have? How well hydrated you are? And the list goes on, right? So all of these variables matter and they're affecting your ability to process food properly. Okay. So if anybody tries to say like, oh, well you have to eat a carnivorous diet because that's the one size fits all prescription for humanity. They're just yanking your chain. And it would be irresponsible of me to say that eating a plant-based diet is a one size fits all prescription for humanity. It's not, it's absolutely not. And I know that, and Chef AJ knows that. But the truth is that there's, uh, what the evidence-based research has shown one more time is that the more plants you consume, the more, the lower your overall chronic disease risk is likely to be. And that is, that is true of the vast majority of the population the vast majority of mammals, okay? The more plants you consume, the lower your risk for chronic disease, okay? But in Jennifer's situation here, it sounds like you, you, whenever you eat carbohydrate-rich food, then you know it could potentially cause problems with blood glucose regulation. So again, I wanna go back to basics. I'm gonna say this over and over again. Number one, we need to have to must figure out what is the total fat content of your diet first. That is a requirement. Okay, if your fat content is high, then carbohydrate metabolism just won't work. Number two, I also want to know uh, what are the other foods that you're consuming on a daily basis? Are you eating a predominantly, you know, sorry, let me back up. When you were consuming a whole food plant-based diet, was there a significant amount of avocados, nuts, and seeds? Was there oil in your diet? Because all that stuff absolutely matters as well. Okay. Uh, number, number two, I also need to know what your C-peptide value is, because if you're saying that you ate carbohydrates and all of a sudden your blood glucose went through the roof, then that could literally be an indicator that your pancreas is not able to produce a sufficient amount of insulin. And that has, that is independent of what you're eating. That is, has nothing to do with what you're eating. It has everything to do with the way that your pancreas functions. Okay. So we have to know those variables. And once we do, we can then piece together a puzzle and find a way to, to, to really test whether or not a plant-based diet is, is something that doesn't work for you at all, which I'm, which I am hesitant to say. And um, instead we can find a way to try and make a plant-based diet work for you because it's such a powerful chronic disease reverse, uh, reversal strategy. Great. 
Okay, I saw a question from Robert. Come on, my little screen is freezing. I can't see it. Um, okay, I'll, while I'm looking for that question, I'll read the one that was submitted in advance from Melissa. Sure. Have you ever worked with type 1 diabetics that don't have a pancreas? If so, what are the unique challenges those without a pancreas would face applying the Mastering Diabetes program? Okay, that's a great question. So when you don't have a pancreas, there's a lot of things that, can go awry. Uh, in addition to not being able to secrete insulin, um, your pancreas is also responsible for the manufacturing and secretion of a whole collection of digestive enzymes. Okay. So here's a way to think about it. Uh, if I were to like pick up your pancreas and hold it in front of me, it would be, you know, it would kind of be like this jellyfish looking funny tissue. Right. So if I'm holding your, your pancreas in front of me, literally 99% or more of your pancreas is responsible for making enzymes that you use to digest your food. Less than 1% of your, of your pancreas makes insulin. 99 plus percent makes what are called carbohydrates and proteases and lipases that are required in order to break down the food that you're actually consuming. So if you don't have a pancreas, then what that means is that every single time you eat food, you're lacking the enzymatic power, the enzymatic cocktail required in order to digest food properly. So first and foremost, you're going to have to take digestive enzymes orally. You're going to literally have to take pills that have the enzymes that are going to help break down the food as it travels down into your digestive system. That's number one. And then number two, in addition to that, we're also going to have to make sure that you are using insulin, both a basal and a bolus insulin in order to help regulate your blood glucose properly. Okay. So it becomes a little bit more of a sophisticated and nuanced game, but it's absolutely possible and something that I would definitely recommend. Because again, eating a plant-based diet not only helps control your blood glucose and diabetes, but it also helps reduce your chronic disease risk overall. So if you're, if you're interested in seeing if the mastering diabetes approach can work for you, what I would recommend for not only you, but everybody here who's here, just go to masteringdiabetes.org slash apply, A-P-P-L-Y, okay? Masteringdiabetes.org slash apply. And there you can apply to be in our personalized coaching program. And we give you a guarantee. Literally, I don't know of a single other coaching program that gives a guarantee. We tell you this. If we cannot help you control your blood sugar and help you lose weight and achieve your ideal body weight, we will literally coach you for free until you do. Period, end of story, okay? And the reason we say that is because we know just how powerful the Mastering Diabetes Method is and it works very well, extremely well, but it's got to be done in a very systematic manner. So if you're interested in learning more about it, masteringdiabetes.org slash apply, fill out the application and we'll see if we can help you out. It's just that simple. That is amazing. Wow. You know, people, I think don't understand that my chat disappears because we're broadcasting to so many different places, but I did see a question from Robert. I believe it was something like, but what if your insulin spikes or your blood sugar spikes when you eat carbs, then what do you do in that case? Yeah. So what you do in that case is you go back to the basics. Like I said before, number one, figure out how much total fat you're consuming. Absolutely required. Number two, once you know that number, make sure it's less than 30 grams of fat per day. Number three, then make sure that the carbohydrate you are eating is not from refined sources, but comes from whole sources. Okay. And then in addition to that, we also have a number of like troubleshooting techniques, which, you know, there's literally 20, 30, 40 of them that, um, you know, it's going to take a long time to describe, but it has to do with timing your exercise regimens. It has to do with injecting insulin at the right time. If insulin is something that you inject, it also has to do with performing intermittent fasting on a regular basis, because that can also help reverse insulin resistance as well. So there's, we have, you know, 20, 30 plus different sort of like tricks, if you will, to help you regulate your blood glucose. But the ones that I already mentioned were, you know, low fat plus whole carbohydrates. That's really the, the formula that's going to work right off the bat. And then again, if it doesn't work for whatever reason, just reach out to us and we'll see whatever we can do to try and help you out. No question. This question might be better for Robbie tomorrow because it's about, yep. but Dina says she was having insulin resistance type symptoms and cut her fruit in half. And she believes there are people that can eat too much fruit. What do you say about that? Yeah, there's definitely some people that can be you know, overeating on their fruit intake. There's no question about it. I mean, there's like, I used to be a raw foodist and I was a raw foodist for 14 years and I ate, I don't know, 25 to 35 
pieces of fruit per day. There's no question about it. Right. Um, and it made me feel great. It made me feel fantastic. I loved it. Um, but again, I'm also a, a biologically unique individual as is Dina. Right. So if you find that, you know, you're lowering your fruit intake and it makes you feel better. Well, if I would say number one, first of all, listen to that. There's no question about that. I'm not going to argue with that because I'm not in your body. Um, so definitely listen to that. Um, but then secondarily, we also have to take a pay attention to everything else that you're eating as well. Uh, it's, it's required in order to understand what the other foods you're eating are doing and how they're interacting with those fruits. And um, once we have that information, then we can sort of like, you can have more information about whether eating a small amount of fruit, a medium amount of fruit, or a high amount of fruit is going to be the optimal solution for you. Nice. Heidi says, can I follow your program if I'm not diabetic, but 30 pounds overweight? If I'm not diabetic, but 30 pounds overweight. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we talk a lot about diabetes and that's sort of our cup of tea for sure. But there's a lot of people that actually do our program and they say, like, I'm not worried about diabetes or I just want to make sure I can prevent diabetes in the future, which is awesome, but they just want to lose weight. And so we actually, uh, in the same way that a ketogenic diet is like a rapid weight loss tool, like I described earlier, the mastering diabetes method is also a rapid weight loss tool. And, you know, I'm chef, chef AJ, I'm sure you can also, um, you know, shed your experience on this as well. But when you eat a truly low fat plant-based whole food diet, uh, weight, just like, it just melts off of you. And, you know, it's, it's hard to prevent it from coming off. There's a lot of people that report back to us. They're like, Oh my God, I have never been able to lose weight this easily. I don't know how it's coming off of me but I love it, right? So if you're just looking to lose 30 pounds, a low fat plant-based whole food diet can absolutely help take you in that direction. And um, I, I would, you know, I, if you haven't tried it yet, I strongly recommend doing it. Oh God, I just saw a great, you guys, because th this, the chat is so active that I'm, I'm missing things and I try to take screenshots, but I just <laughs> saw something really, really amazing here. But until I find it again, I hope I, they'll post it again. I'll ask a previously submitted question from Linda. And what is, in your opinion, the benefit of intermittent fasting for people with diabetes? Oh yeah. So when I was at UC Berkeley, I studied for five years about how to create insulin resistance and reverse insulin resistance. And we, we ran you know, hundreds of experiments here to try and figure out what's the most effective way to create it. And then once it's created, is it reversible? And secondarily, what's the best way to reverse it? And one of the things that we kept on coming up with over and over and over and over and over and over again is that intermittent fasting slash calorie restriction is incredibly powerful. Okay, so intermittent fasting is basically just like an umbrella term to describe what happens when you manipulate the timing of your food intake? That's all it is. It's basically a way that you can play with the timing of how much food you're eating or, or of your food intake. And then by using that to your advantage, you can get a number of benefits, okay? So we recommend performing a, what's called a 16-8 intermittent fast on a daily basis. So what that means is 16 hours of fasting and approximately eight hours of eating per day. So 16 plus eight equals 24 hours in a day. And what that would mean is that you're basically just like finding a way to like not eat food for approximately 16 hours. And your sleep definitely in, is included in that if you want it to be. And then only eight, eat during an eight hour window of time. And so what we find is that when people do this, number one, weight loss is accelerated. <laughs> number two, the, uh, their blood glucose comes down dramatically and it comes down predictably. Number three, fasting insulin levels and post-meal insulin levels come down predictably and very reliably. Number four, they anticipated that they were gonna be starving and that they were gonna be uncomfortable, but the exact opposite happens. They actually feel better. They feel better. They don't really crave food in that 16 hour window. And instead they're just like, hey, I could do this for, I could do this indefinitely. This feels fantastic, okay? And uh, so, from a biological perspective, one of the things that's happening is that when you perform an intermittent fast on a frequent basis, what you're doing is you remember the story I told you earlier where we had excess fatty acids that were deposited inside of your liver and muscle. Well, intermittent fasting provides your liver and muscle an opportunity, an extended opportunity to go find those fatty acids internally and start to oxidize or, or, or get rid of them or turn them into, into energy. And so when you sort of like cut off your liver and muscle from 
food that's coming into your mouth, then you force those two tissues to sort of like go internal. And when they go internal, then all of a sudden you start to remove those excess fatty acid deposits, which then helps you regain insulin action, which then helps you lower your blood glucose. So it's a win, 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 win. And I highly recommend it if it's something that you haven't experimented with up to this point. Great. Thank you, Christina, for retyping your question. Guys, realize I'm streaming the seven places you're watching from one. So you see a lot less in the chat that I do and it goes fast and it disappears. But here's the question I was looking for. Please ask Cyrus if it's possible to develop type two diabetes from a high fat whole food plant-based vegan diet, for example, for a, from a 40% fat diet, but where the fat only comes from whole plant sources. Great. It's a great question. So uh, the, what is the name of the person who asked that? Christina. Christina, thank you. Um, so Christina, the answer is yes, you can absolutely develop. Uh, you, what you can develop is what's called insulin resistance, the precursor to prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. So a high fat diet is a very, very is the most effective way to create insulin resistance in your body. Okay, so whether the fat that you're consuming comes from animal sources or whether it comes from plant sources, too much fat is too much fat. And too much fat can cause insulin resistance, which can then cause your blood glucose to go high. And over the course of time, that insulin resistance can, doesn't always necessarily, but can turn in to prediabetes and type two diabetes. So if you're eating a high your fat diet, 40% or beyond, and you're finding that your blood glucose is hard to control, or you're developing insulin resistance, or you're developing prediabetes and your A1C is going up, then I would highly recommend lowering your fat intake and watching what happens. I would, I would, I'd put hundred dollars down that if you were to lower your fat intake to less than 15%, that your A1C would come down and you'd probably feel a lot better and your blood glucose would become more manageable. Yeah. That's the thing. I, you know, I, I, I didn't say this, but Dr. McDougall has said this about one of his mentors, Dr. Kempner, who mm -hmm. very much reverse diabetes with, uh, you know, carbs, with white rice, with sugar, yep. with juice. He said that Dr. Kempner would say that all dieters are liars. Now I'm not saying people are liars, but I think people do tend to underreport what they eat. I can't tell you how many times I've been in the yeah. presence of Dr. Lyle, Dr. Goldhammer, and people say, I eat exactly like AJ and I can't lose weight. And then I watch them and they don't eat like me. I don't eat nut seeds and avocados. I don't eat at restaurants. And I, so I think people sometimes don't realize that they're eating a lot more fat than they are, especially if they're eating at other people's houses. If they're eating at restaurants, you really can't get an oil-free meal. I'm sorry, you can't. So residual oil is on the cookware. They, they don't know what no oil means. And they don't realize that when you make your kid's peanut butter sandwich, you lick the spoon, you know, that's like, you know, it's 10 grams of fat right there. So I think, like you said, you know, Dr. Goldhammer spoke to my group last week and he says, he's never seen this not work. When people were saying they eat just like me and they can't lose weight, he goes, please come to True North because we'd like to study you and put you in the medical journal because nobody ever doesn't lose weight at True North eating exactly how you're saying. It's, it's so funny you say that. It, it's so funny you say that. Okay. So what Dr. Goldhammer is saying is he's basically saying like, listen, I want you to come to True North and I want you to be here and I want you to be under my supervision because when somebody's under my supervision, it works because he has the opportunity, him and his staff can control the environment in which a person is operating. And by controlling that environment, he can get the result that he's looking for. Okay. Typical scientist, absolute typical scientist. You got to control your variables very, very uh, well. And then when you do, you get a predictable result. Okay. I'm the exact same way. Okay. I I've studied science for, you know, more than 20 plus years of my life, like very rigorous science. And one thing I can tell you is that when you follow the mastering diabetes method in particular, the way that we describe it, like actually follow it the way that we describe it or actually eat the way that chef AJ eats, then you can get the results that I'm talking about. You can get the results that chef AJ has experienced and that she helps other people get right. That's the exact same reason why we have this philosophy in our coaching program, which is we guarantee your results, period, end of story. I can say that with confidence and my coaches can say that with confidence because when you're under our control, when you're following by our rules, when we are able to control your environment and your lifestyle, we know that it will work. We know it will work, period, end of story. So in the same way that Goldhammer is saying, come to True North and I will guarantee your results, I'm saying, come to Mastering Diabetes, we will guarantee your results because we know how to make it work, right? So if you're struggling with this, then just consider it, just fill out an application and see if it's something that you want to do. But, um, you know, 
small things that you don't think make a difference actually do make a difference. You know what, the, the, you know, in marketing, they say the riches are in the niches. And in this, it, that is exactly where the success lies. And they, people say, I eat just like you, except for the alcohol and the coffee and the peanut butter and the bread and the chocolate. It's like, well, you don't in the salt, you don't eat like me at all. You know, <laughs> anytime I, we did a program a few years ago, we're not doing it anymore. We had a business program and we still teach business classes, my husband and I, but the thing is they weren't here for weight loss, this group of people, they weren't living with me. They stayed in Airbnb, but they came and they studied with us like, you know, like between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. So I, I did all their meals. Every single person there in this, in, in, for of our business class, and they weren't there for health or weight loss, but they were of a variety of weights. Some people were slender, some people were a little thicker, and every single person went home like four pounds thinner. And they couldn't believe it because I was giving them dessert at every meal, but my kind of desserts, and like, you're feeding us too much. And I'm like, really? Because I'm still hungry. They don't get calorie density in a low fat environment. They just, if they could get it, they could be so happy because they'd be able to eat so much food like you, me and Robbie. Like, I, I mean, I stuff myself silly at every meal. Like I'm just so totally. full all the time. And totally. I'm so happy with my food. But the thing is, it's a trade, you know, for some people it's a trade off because they really want those nuts, seeds and avocados. But you can have them, but, or you can have like a gazillion pounds of potatoes and rice every day. Like I do and be right. as happy as, you know, I don't know. I just, I'm just so happy with, and I love that you guys eat just like, and we eat a little bit differently. I mean, Robbie obviously is centers on fruit, but the idea of the, the percentages that we eat and the, and that there's no restriction and that we're not adding oil, salt, and sugar to our food. It's like, we're like two peas in a pod. That's probably why I love you guys so much. Yeah, absolutely. So, it's funny because when, when we first started communicating about, you know, like what's your dietary philosophy and what's our dietary philosophy? It's literally, I would, I would argue that it's pretty much like a 99% overlap. Yeah. I, no, I can't really think of anything that's different really. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't be closer. So Matt says, can you please explain how protein can have a pro insulin, insulinogenic effect on the body? Yes. I, this is a phenomenal question. It's one of my favorite. Okay. Uh, there's been some study in people living with type one diabetes. Uh, like me, again, I have type one diabetes, as does Robbie, as do you know, thousands of people that have come through this program. Type one diet, people with type one diabetes are fantastic ex, uh, experimental subjects because we don't produce a sufficient amount of insulin. Therefore, you know, you can say that we're like broken in a way. And when something is broken, you can control it. And then by controlling it, you can really see what's happening under the hood. Okay. So experiments of people with type one diabetes demonstrate that if you take a meal and you have a, a medium carbohydrate value to that meal, okay? So it's something like on the order of about 50 grams of carbohydrate, okay? And then in group number one, you take people, you feed them 50 grams of carbohydrate and a small amount of protein, like 10 grams of protein, okay? You feed that to uh, you know people living with type one diabetes and you watch what happens to their blood glucose and insulin over the course of the next six hours. In group number two, you take people with type one diabetes and you feed them the same amount of carbohydrate, but you give them 30 grams of protein. And then you watch what happens to their blood glucose and insulin over the course of the next six hours. What you find is that the people who had the higher protein meal have a what's called a delayed onset hyperglycemic and hyperinsulinemic response. So it's a long-winded way of me saying, for the first three hours, their blood glucose profile looks beautiful. Everything looks perfect. There's a little bit of a rise and then there's a little bit of a come down and it looks beautiful. Starting at the three hour marker, all of a sudden blood glucose starts to rise and insulin starts to rise and it starts to go up and 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 up. And up. So it's a delayed onset, high blood glucose, high insulin response to the protein meal that they consume. Okay. And this, these experiments have been repeated in, you know, multiple different fashions and using sort of slightly different experimental, uh, you know, setups. But the idea here is that protein when consumed, usually on the order of about 30 grams or more on a single meal basis ends up with a, what's called insulinogenic response or a increased biological requirement for insulin secretion. And so if you're trying to keep your insulin secretion low, which is generally a good philosophy in life then what that means is that you want to limit your protein intake. Okay. Protein is necessary. Don't get me wrong. I should eat protein. Chef AJ should eat protein. Richard should eat protein. Everyone in this room should be eating protein. There's no question, but there's, there's a certain amount of protein, which is required for optimal biological function. But when you exceed that amount, then it can take a toll on your insulinogenic response and it can actually cause excess insulin secretion, which can then lead to problems down the road. 
know, I had Dr. McDougal on the show earlier and he was talking about how breast milk is like 5% protein, you know, or people are worried about something they don't need to be worried about. Yeah. Jeanette wants to know how come you're not raw anymore? Oh, how come I'm not raw anymore? Okay. Here's why I'm not raw because my wife is not raw and I enjoy eating food with my wife. We have a good time. We love to be in the kitchen. We love to cook together. And uh, when I first met her and she was eating, you know, like things like quinoa and, and potatoes and starchy vegetables and steamed vegetables, I was sort of like, I was always kind of like looking over at her plate and I was like, ooh, I kind of want to eat some of those potatoes. I want some of that, right? And so um, I also had another conversation with uh, Dr. Joel Furman. And in that conversation, we were talking at length about, you know, like what are the pros and cons of cooking food? And he actually educated me about the fact that like, you know, when you lightly steam cruciferous vegetables in particular, you can actually increase the biological, the bioavailability of certain anti-carcinogenic compounds. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that, right? So, you know, you kind of put two and two together where I was like wanting to eat more cooked food and then finding benefits to eating cooked food. And so I started meandering towards eating a little bit more cooked food and, uh, you know, I started to enjoy it. And so, you know, I started out with just a small amount of cooked food and then I kind of like increased it over the course of time. And sometimes I find that there's things that work and there's things that don't work. And, um, you know, I've gotten to a point where, you know, if I had to estimate, I'd say I probably eat 70% of my food as uncooked and then maybe like 30% of my food is cooked. And uh, when I do it that way, I, I feel great. I can have awesome meals with my wife. And, uh, you know, I'm getting a lot of the benefits of, you know, cooking food lightly and um, it's a win-win situation. That's great. So Mark says, is it possible to get off all diabetic medication? Oh, Mark, absolutely. It is absolutely possible. So we see this regularly and it's reported in the medical literature a lot, which is that if you reverse insulin resistance using your diet, the way I'm describing, then you can not only reduce your need for insulin, whether that insulin comes from an injection or whether it comes from your own pancreas, but your biological need for all these oral insulin sensitizing medications goes down dramatically. Whether those are things like metformin, which is a very widely prescribed medication, or whether these things called GLP-1 agonists or whether they're SGLT2 inhibitors, these are all different classes of pharmaceutical medications that can become pretty complex, but um, there's many different types of diabetes medications. And when you improve your blood glucose control, then your biological need for those medications goes down, 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 down to the point where all of a sudden you don't need them anymore. And you can regulate your blood glucose in the normal range 100% of the time. And that's it. You're in your new normal and that's your new life. Mike. Gina says, where's your gorgeous wife? She's on the show this week. I don't remember what day, but Kylie will be here. So stay tuned all week for someone from Mastering Diabetes. Christissa says, does an eight hour feeding window, does, does it encourage gallstones? Or could gallstones be a problem with an eight hour feeding window? I've never been asked that question. I don't, I don't know why it would. Let's put it that way. I don't know why it would. Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I haven't, I haven't read anything in particular about that. But right off the top of my bat, my, my head, I would say, I, I, I can't think of why I would. The only thing I've heard with people, I've seen this in a couple of people that I've known personally, that when they lose weight very, very quickly, they seem to get gallstones. Okay. Do you know the, the reason why that happens? I don't know, but it, it, just, it could be coincidence, but at least three people I know have had, had their gallbladders out. And, and these were people that lost a tremendous amount of weight very quickly. So that could be- yeah. Got it. It's good to know. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not that familiar with that. Right. Okay, cool. And uh, Tammy says, could Cyrus talk about how strength training increases insulin sensitivity? Woo. One of my favorite subjects. Okay. Strength training. Uh, so there's, there's multiple different types of exercise, right? There's, there's three sort of predominant modes of exercise. There's what's called endurance activity or cardiovascular exercise. Okay. Where you're predominantly exercising your cardiovascular, uh, where you're performing exercise that um, allows you to exercise for long periods of time. That's a simple way to think about cardiovascular. So running, biking, hiking, swimming, um, sort of like continuous motion, long duration, cardiovascular exercise. The second type of exercise is called resistance exercise. That's where you're, you're resisting some type of force. The resistance could be your own body weight. Like you could be doing air squats. You could be doing push-ups, You could be doing pull-ups, or you could actually be lifting weights at a gym. Okay. Any of those are considered resistance exercise. And then the third modality is called combination exercise, which is a combination of cardiovascular 
and resistance exercise put into one. And those are, that's like interval type training. You can do things like CrossFit or high intensity interval training where you're doing weightlifting plus cardiovascular, boom, put into one type of exercise. And that can be very demanding, but also extremely fun. Okay. So the question is, how does resistance exercise benefit insulin sensitivity? Well, when you perform resistance exercise, one of the things that you're doing is you're calling upon your muscle tissue to have to contract and elongate very quickly, hundreds if not thousands of times um, over the course of one single exercise session. And when you're placing a load on that musculature and you're forcing those contractions and elongations to happen, then what ends up happening is you end up developing what are called micro tears in the, uh, in the muscle tissue. Okay. So you can think of your muscle tissue as basically having like, you know, a bunch of fibers. Okay. And so these fibers are sort of like interlocked with each other and they form a very strong, uh, you know, a very strong tissue that's capable of withstanding a significant amount of force. Now, when you perform resistance exercise, you force contraction, elongation, contraction, elongation, contraction, elongation. And when you put load on that, then at the end of the exercise regimen or the end of the exercise session, your muscle tissue actually kind of looks like this. It's kind of got this like, kind of like weird, torn, frayed appearance to it. Okay. So now the goal is to try and take this muscle tissue that looks frayed and turn it and stitch it back together so that it can become normal and sort of like more flat once again. And then when you do that, um, then you can go use that tissue again. You can go use that muscle again. Okay. So the trick is to try and get something that's like frayed and restitch it back together. And when you restitch it back together, it's actually a little bit stronger, like one, maybe 2% stronger than it was before. And then when you tear it again and restitch and tear it again and restitch and tear it again and restitch, then you end up with a stronger tissue over the course of time. And that's how you gain strength um, when you're performing resistance exercise. Okay. So how's that benefit insulin sensitivity? Well, not only are you restitching the tissue using amino acids from protein, those are the sort of primary, uh, primary, what's the word I'm looking for? Like Lego piece that's going to help restitch that tissue together, but you're also depleting internal fuel stores. One of the primary fuel stores that you burn when you're performing resistance exercise is called glycogen. And glycogen is basically like a stored granule of glucose. And so you have this stored glucose on board, then you go and you perform resistance-based exercise and that, that glycogen granule becomes the predominant fuel source. And all of a sudden the glycogen granule started out this big and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you start to deplete it over the course of time. So let's say you go to a CrossFit class and 30 minutes later, you're just like pass out on the floor and you're like, wow, that was challenging, right? Well, your glycogen content inside of your muscle has decreased call it, it decreased by 20, 30, 40, 60% over the course of that 60 minutes. Okay. So when the glycogen content is smaller, that means that now the muscle tissue is hungry. It's very hungry for nutrients. It requires amino acids to stitch the tissue back together. And it requires glucose to put back into that glycogen granule so that you have fuel for the next time around. So when you go perform, when, when, when you're done with exercise, and your muscle tissue is literally hungry. It's saying, put stuff into me now. That's your opportunity to put carbohydrate into your mouth. Carbohydrate from whole sources into your mouth because that carbohydrate becomes glucose. And those glucose molecules can get inside of your muscle to go refill that glycogen storage tank. And when you allow that system to unfold properly in the post-exercise state, you can put glucose into your muscle either for free or for very small amounts of insulin. Okay. So that's where the insulin sensitivity benefit comes in. Okay. So think about it as though if you deplete your glycogen stores, then you're allowed to put glucose back in for a very small amount of insulin. And that's a good thing because now your carbohydrate to insulin ratio is very large. Lots of carbohydrate for a very small amount of insulin. And that's how you can get away with eating much larger quantities of carbohydrate without having to increase your injection volumes or without having to force your pancreas to manufacture a lot of insulin because it's just not required. Yeah, that makes sense? You know, everything, you just know this so well. It's like, I just love, I don't even have diabetes and I just love hearing you talk. I, I love this stuff. Exercise physiology is fantastic. No, I can tell. It's, 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 so, it's such a pleasure talking to you. Tom says, what are some of the signs of insulin resistance? Does it impact one's blood pressure? And if so, how? Okay. Uh, here's what the, the simplest thing to do is to remember the, 
the acronym PILAF, P-I-L-A-F, like rice PILAF, okay? P is for pressure. If your blood pressure is elevated, that could indicate that you are insulin resistant. Number two, I. Uh, what does I stand for? Is I'm hitting a blank on I. L is for lipids, okay? L is for lipids. So if your cholesterol lipid panel is elevated, then that's another indicator that your vasculature is in a state of distress. So you wanna take a look at your LDL cholesterol in particular, but if that's elevated, then that's an, another indicator that you could be living in an insulin resistant state. A is for A1C, okay? So A1C is, if your A1C is elevated beyond 5.7%, that's the sort of cutoff for prediabetes, then that's another indicator, that's a strong indicator that you are living in an insulin resistant state. And then F is for fasting blood glucose. So if your fasting glucose is greater than 100, then that's an indicator that you are in an insulin resistant state. And I, I just remembered it, is for ideal body weight. If your ideal body weight, if you're, if you're greater than your ideal body weight, then that's another reason, or that's another indicator that you could be living in an insulin resistant state, okay? So the reason why we came up with this acronym PILAF is because we want you to take into account multiple different biomarkers. We don't want you to just pay attention to your fasting glucose or just look at your A1C. I want you to look at your blood pressure, your body weight, your lipid panel, your A1C value, and your fasting uh, blood glucose. And when you pay attention to all five of those metrics and you try and get every single one of them to their ideal, within their ideal range, that's how you reverse insulin resistance. That's how you can truly become the most you know, insulin sensitive you've ever been before. And when you do that, then your risk for diabetes goes, goes down and it can go away completely. When I think of pilaf, I think of rice. And when I think of rice, I think of Dr. Walter Kempner and people, all these doctors that promote these high fat diets, do, do they not, have they never heard of Walter Kempner and how he reversed diabetes and got people not just to their trim weight, but to some of the leanest weights ever on a diet of white rice, sugar, and fruit juice. Yeah, I know. So th the main complaint against Walter Kempner is that his patients lost weight. You hear this all the time. They go, oh, well, they didn't, they didn't reverse diabetes because they were eating the rice fruit diet. They reversed diabetes because they lost weight. And I'm like, come on, you've got to be kidding me. But that's actually not true because if you fast forward to 1979 and you take a look at James W. Anderson out of the University of Montreal, he actually performed he, he followed up on Walter Kempner's research where he goes, oh, okay, well, there's a lot of complaints that Walter Kempner didn't control his variables properly. I'm going to enroll people who are insulin dependent in my study, and I'm not going to let them lose any weight. So he took 30 people living with type two diabetes who are insulin dependent. And he said, if you lose a single pound in my study, I'm going to kick you out. And people were like, whoa, okay, 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 okay. So they came into a study. He flipped them from a, from a, a like a standard omnivorous diet to a low fat plant-based whole food diet, boom. He took people who had literally been injecting insulin for years and within 16 days, he was able to start, uh, he was able to get some of those patients off of insulin altogether. 16 days after injecting insulin for years, okay? So he basically said, hey guys, number one, weight loss, not required. Number two, a low fat plant-based whole food diet is absolutely an insulin sensitizing mechanism. And I can prove it to you because I can lower your insulin requirements within a very short period of time without changing your total calorie intake. It's pretty cool. And I want to meet him and interview him. Why don't more people know about him? This is, I know this is one, of my, one of my favorite studies of all time. And he really like, he really demonstrated without a shadow of a doubt that weight loss is helpful, but not required. Do you know him? No, I would love to get to know this okay, guy. Okay, I'm going to find him because I'm really good at that. I'm like a little investigative journalist with this show. I find these people and I, if he's willing to do an interview, because this is really, that's incredible. Yeah. So one of the reasons I so align with you and Robbie is because, you know, I don't know about you guys, because you're male and you can handle it, but I get bashed all the time that I'm, my diet is dangerous because I'm not advocating mandatory nut seeds and avocado every day. Yet you, me and Robbie all had our fatty acid profile, profiles on the air of some summits or these, these types of broadcasts looked at by doctors and they're stellar. And I haven't added nut seeds or avocado in like over 10 years and guess, and I haven't dropped dead. Can you believe it? I know it's incredible. <laughs> you know what? Actually I was, I can look up. Uh, I have it stored on my computer. 
Um, do you happen to know what your omega-3 status was or your omega-6 to I'm gonna ratio? Look, I'm going to look it up. I, I, I don't have it memorized. I just know it's really good, but I'm going to try to look it up while you are um, answering the next question, if you don't mind. Yeah, and, go for it. And, and it is from Glendo. How do you do this with kidney failure? Oh, with kidney failure. It's one of my favorite questions. Okay. Before we get there, let me just share my screen really with you guys real quick. I'm going to pull up my Omega Quant results. Okay, so you can see right here, name, Cyrus Kambada, born October 2nd, 1980. This test was done in 2018. So that was like three years ago. All right, so here's what it says. Uh, my Omega-3 index right here is considered 7.11%, okay? So even though it says that it's in the yellow range and desirable is eight to 12, the truth is that the majority of the American population is down here below 4%, okay? So- most people are hovering with an omega-3 index of like, you know, two, two and a half, three percent or something like that. And to get an omega-3 uh, index of 7.11% um, is actually quite high, even though it claims that it's in the yellow. So I took these results and I sent them over to Dr. Rick Dina. And I also sent them over to Dr. Joel Furman. And I was like, hey, could you guys interpret this for me? And both of them were like, whoa, this is a really, really good result. Okay. So that's the first thing. Secondarily, if you take a look at this omega-6 to omega-3 ratio right here, oops, sorry about that. This omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, what you want is an omega-3 to 6 to 3 ratio of somewhere between 3 and 5. And what this indicates is that the fatty acid distribution within your food is in the anti-inflammatory state. If the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is higher up here into like 9, 10, 15, 20 to one, this indicates that there's a significant amount of inflammation inside of your vasculature. So you, if your result is high, you want to get it down here. And what this shows is that by eating a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, I was able to lower my ratio to a 3.3, which is considered quite good. Again, this is another indicator of inflammation. The lower the number here, the lower your arachidonic acid to uh, icosapentaenoic acid is, the better. Again, I'm at an 8.3, which is in the desirable range. Now, if you take a look at Robbie's results, his is even better. He had a higher omega-3 status right here. So he's more in the green than I was, which is awesome. And his omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is even lower. So he's even more anti-inflammatory than I am. And his AA to EPA ratio is even lower than mine, right? So by both accounts, Robbie is in a highly anti-inflammatory state, as am I. And this, and neither one of us, here's the, here's the kicker. Robbie and I are not sitting there eating lots of nuts and seeds. We're not taking omega-3 supplements. We're not eating fish oil. We're literally just eating lots of fruits and vegetables. And by doing so, our, our omega-3 status is actually better than we had anticipated. Yep. I just put mine in the chat. Uh, I didn't know how else to get it to you because cool. it's not on a slide. So you could take a look at mine and tell me what you think. And I can, I'll be happy to post it in this chat as well. Okay. Uh... Let's see here. So your omega-3, let me, let me read this. Here. Okay. Your omega-3 index is, where does it even say your omega-3 index? I would have gotten it to you in advance if I, uh, my omega-3 index, is that 4.1? Is that it? Is that your, one? your omega-3 index is 4.0, 4.0. Okay. So that's good. That's actually what you're looking for is an omega-3 index of four or greater. So you're basically right on the threshold. It's 4.1. It says. 4.1. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Then your omega six to omega three ratio. That's maybe the one that's 4.1. It says my risk is low. Oh, it's four. Yeah. 4% for my index and 4.1 for the three to six. And then it, it has EPA, arachidonic acid, EPA, and DHA on this one. Yeah. So you're very similar to us in that your omega six to omega three ratio is very low. It's in a 4.1 range, which is actually good. Because again, you don't want it hanging out in the 10 to 15 range. You want it as close to three to five as possible. So you're right smack dab in the middle. And then your omega-3 status is a 4.0, which is, yeah. So you're, you're in an anti-inflammatory uh, uh, vascular state, which is, which is great. It's awesome to see. This is such cool stuff. Um, let's see. Matt says, has Cyrus ever had more body fat than he wanted? <laughs> Have I ever had more body fat? So the answer is no. I've actually, I'm sort of like a genetic, whatever, whatever you want to call it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an ectomorph, which means that my body, uh, the, the sort of like, what's the word I'm looking for? 
I, I tend to be very low fat. I tend to be, uh, have a very high metabolism and, um, I tend to be the type of person that can, I, I can just like, I can eat thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of calories. And it just doesn't ever seem to like show up on my body. Um, for people like me, it's actually very hard to gain weight. It's extremely hard to gain weight. Um, and, um, so I'm sort of like at my biological set point and like, it's, it's challenging for me to go any higher than that. Um, I did, I was curious. So I went and I had my body fat measured. Um, and they didn't, they, they did it in a, in a hydrostatic situation, which means that they basically put you into a tank of water and you lie flat. And then you have to exhale all of the air out of your body and keep exhaling and exhaling and exhaling. And at the moment you have no more air, you continue to exhale until they can get an accurate measurement for you in underwater, hundred percent with zero or as little air inside of you as possible. And then they use that body weight and they compare it against your body weight on land. And they come up with a calculation of what your body fat percentage is. And when I got that calculation done, which is considered the most accurate calculation, my body fat percentage, well, actually, let me, let me get in the chat box. You tell me, what do you think my body fat percentage was? Okay. Um, yeah, you don't want me to say it. Okay. Let me, uh, let yeah. Me I'll, I'll tell you guys what it is in a second, okay. but I'm curious what people oh, think. Come on chat box. Let's see chat. I'm going to guess this. You see that? Okay. So chef AJ thinks that my body fat percentage was 11%. Okay. Good guess. Okay. Are there any other guesses coming in the chat box here? Guys, you want to guess? 10%, 5% from Lauren, 3% from Regina, 2.5% from Lee, 8% from Cassandra, okay. 7% from Gina and Arlene, 10% from Nancy. Okay. 12%. So we're looking at like anywhere from like two all the way upwards of 10, two to 11. Yeah, two okay. to 11. Two to 12 is what we're seeing right now. Two to 12. I suspected that my body weight, my body fat percentage was going to be like seven to 8%. Uh, it was 3.8%. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it was, I literally looked at the guy who was doing the measurements and I was like, should I be concerned? I was like 3.8. That's really low. And he was like, no, 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 you're fine. He's like, when your body fat percentage goes too low, um, if you are feeling it inside of your joints, that's when your synovial fluid, the, the like lubricant inside of your joints is too low. If you're not feeling that, then you're totally fine. You're just a, you're just a, a lean individual and you should celebrate that. And I was like, great. Sounds like a plan. Oh my God. That's incredible. But you're also very muscular too. It's not like you're just, you know, it's little. all the steroids I'm, I'm injecting <laughs> on a daily basis. All the animal products you're eating, right? All the animal products. <laughs> <laughs> so Anna, Anna asked this question and I get this a lot. And, you know, even though I had Dr. McDougall on today and he talks about this a lot, she says, well, if you don't eat nuts, seeds and avocado, where do you get your fat from? And I think people don't realize there's fat in pretty much everything. Yeah. There's fat all over the place. There's fat all over the place. I mean, uh, here's an example. I eat garbanzo beans. I like garbanzo beans. I just really enjoy them. Okay. Uh, go take a look at the amount of fat that's in garbanzo beans. There's a significant quantity of them. Okay. Uh, there's, if you consume oatmeal, there's a lot of fat in oatmeal. Okay. If you have, um, cocoa nibs, which I like to put on my smoothie bowls, there's a little bit of fat in those. Okay. I get some from, uh, chia seeds. I get some from flax seeds. I have a little bit of avocado here and there, just a tiny bit. Right. Uh, there's a little bit of fat in bananas. There's a little bit of fat in um, quinoa, right? So if you take a, you know, if you take a lot of small numbers and you add them together, you end up with a bigger number. Okay, I'll tell you right off the bat, my total fat intake on a daily basis is somewhere around nine to twelve percent, depending on how many garbanzo beans I eat. It's literally just that. Okay, so um, you know, I'm sort of trying to maintain that optimal ten to fifteen percent range, and when you do that. Um, you know, you just eat lots of whole foods and you don't have to necessarily worry about your fat intake being too low. You really don't. Yeah. In the same way that you, especially if you're eating a lot of vegetables, which both you and I and Robbie do. Well, that's not both. All three of us are eating a lot of greens. That's a true statement. That's a true. I will be the first person to admit that I don't eat as many greens as I should. And I probably don't eat as many greens as you do. But the reason you're bringing that up is because you can get a significant fat content from your greens as well. Right. Yeah, people don't realize like personally, and I, I it's, it's so cheap. It's like four bunches for 99 cents at the ethnic market. That is just a very high source of these omega-3 fatty acids. Yeah, there you go. 
Yeah. You're, you're, you're encouraging me to eat more greens. And every time I do it, I'm like, man, I should really eat more of these. I'm not, in summer, I'm not as good because it's just, you know, it's been 118 and I'd, I'd rather have watermelon than steamed kale when it's 118. To That's be a honest. good point. But I am, I'm going to be filming a weight loss Wednesday today and I'm going to be making kale. So how do you like that? I love so, it. Uh, Matt, M- Mary says, Dr. Cyrus Kambata is awesome. Yes, he is. And Thank you. Awesome. Mari, you're awesome. Did, um, you know, the person with kidney failure, I recommend they have a consultation with a plant-based doctor like Dr. Goldhammer Ooh. or one of the doctors at True North or something like that. And uh, that's what I think would be a good idea. Uh, yeah. People are asking um, how you feel about caffeine and salt. Can I answer the kidney question from before? Sure. I thought you did. I'm sorry. No, it's my fault. I didn't go into it in detail. Okay. Uh, so when you, when you have a compromised kidney, if you're in, you can basically have Uh, multiple stages of chronic kidney disease. You can have what's called stage one, stage two, stage three, or stage four. So chronic kidney disease, otherwise known as CKD kind of progresses over the course of time from one to two to three to four. If you're in stage four, you're what's called end stage renal failure and end stage renal failure usually requires dialysis. And if dialysis is basically a machine that like filters your blood because your kidneys can't do it. And, uh, sometimes people who are in end stage renal failure are on a transplant list to try and get a functioning kidney from someone else. Okay. So the goal is at any point in the CKD spectrum to try and take you from where you are and move you back to as close to stage one or stage zero as possible. The question is, can you do it using a plant-based diet? Okay. So there's a, uh, everything that I've learned about chronic kidney disease came from Dr. Sean Hashmi. Okay, so look him up. H A S H M. Been on the show a couple of times. Love yeah, it. I know. This show, yes. Yeah. So go back and watch some of Chef AJ's previous talks with Dr. Sean Hashmi, or go look him up online. He may be doing telehealth. I'm not 100 percent sure, but Sean Hashmi, Sha Hashmi is an encyclopedia of information, and he has shown uh, both in people as well as in research that chronic kidney disease is absolutely reversible, and your kidney responds not only to specific foods that you're eating, but to the overall micronutrient and macronutrient content of your diet, okay? So in the same way that I told you that if you're focused on a specific food and you're saying, I can't eat a banana because my blood glucose goes up and I'm saying, hold on, I want you to back up and don't pay attention to the specific food. I want you to take a look at your overall general macronutrient intake. I want you to take a look at your overall diet first, And then once you've constructed your overall diet to have a very low fat content, then you can go eat these very specific foods that have a lot of carbohydrate in them. Same thing when it comes to kidneys. The the traditional kidney approach is, oh, well, you have stage three chronic kidney disease or stage four end stage renal failure. You have to limit your intake of foods that are high in sodium and potassium and phosphorus, because that's the only way that you can have a, that, that you can prevent yourself from um, having excess sodium or, or potassium or phosphorus inside of your blood, okay? So again, if you zero in on the particular foods that are high in sodium and potassium and phosphorus, then you miss the bigger picture. The bigger picture is why are my kidneys not working? And part of the reason that your kidneys can become, uh, can develop CKD over the course of time is because this, the, the quantity of saturated fat in your diet is too high. The quantity of pro-inflammatory protein is too high that comes mainly from animal sources. So zoom out, take a look at your overall diet and say, okay, what's in my overall diet? How much animal protein, how much animal saturated fat is in my diet? How much micronutrients am I consuming on a daily basis? And when you can recognize that your kidney is responding to excess protein from animal sources, mainly excess saturated fat from animal sources, mainly, then you have an opportunity to decrease your quantity of total protein and decrease your quantity of saturated fat. When you do that, then your kidneys all of a sudden respond by saying, Hey, you know what? I'm more operational. I'm starting to become less inflammatory. And then when they do, you can start to put back in the foods that are high in sodium and potassium and phosphorus. And when you do that, all of a sudden you regain normal kidney function and you're eating a plant-based diet and the world is your oyster. Okay. So it's very important to understand that your kidneys respond to inflammation. And you have to become more, you have to become less inflammatory by limiting your total protein and fat intake. And when you do that, then all of a sudden your kidneys start to function once again. Where did that saying, the world is your oyster come from? I don't, I don't know. 
It's I don't know. It's, it's a, a weird saying. saying. It really is. I really, and you know, so one of the questions that disappeared, but I thought was interesting is someone was saying they had two cats that were diabetic and can they use this on animals? Cats are carnivores, but you know, I'm wondering Cyrus, like uh, there's no way to test animals in the wild for diabetes, but I'm guessing if they're in the wild, they're eating their natural diet, which is much lower in fat than commercial pet food. Yeah, absolutely. But you're absolutely right. I have two cats and I've had the, the pleasure of having two carnivores inside of our purely <laughs> plant-based household. And it's fascinating to watch them eat. Um, they are, they're what's called obligate carnivores. They have to need to have to eat meat because they have a completely different digestive system and a completely different metabolic design than human beings. They're, they're different they're, You can't even compare the two of us together. Okay. If you take a look at their teeth, their teeth are like sharp. I mean, they have, they have literally like triangular shaped teeth that you put your finger in their mouth and they bite down on it. They will draw blood on you. We don't have the same type of teeth. Our teeth are flat, right? Okay. So that's one di difference. Number two, the length of their digestive tract is totally different. It's much shorter than the length of our digestive tract. And as a result of that, we have a completely different enzymatic, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Enzymatic character and enzymatic, uh, you know, machinery than they do. Um, they also have, uh, they have to consume a significant amount of what's called taurine, which is an amino acid that human beings have a very low requirement for. And so as a result of that, they have to be eating meat in order to get that taurine in order for them to function normally. So point being is if they're eating in the wild, they'll be just fine. If they're eating commercially raised food that has a higher fat content, it has a higher corn content, it has a higher wheat content, it has a higher soy content. They're not going to be happy because those are not ingredients which are, which are optimal for them. And as a result of that, they become diabetic over the course of time. They become, uh, they can develop heart disease as well, just like you and me. Yeah. Teresa says, I don't have diabetes, but this is the best interview ever. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Thank you so much. You just such a, a wealth of information. It's like everything you want to know about diabetes, but we're afraid to ask. And, and we have six more days of people that are in your training program that that will be able to help people as well cool um first of all teresa thank you for the comment that's a very nice thing to say i appreciate that uh chef aj thank you for having me on here um i love talking with you love i mean you and i could talk for hours about you know metabolism and beyond and um for those of you that are still here with us and who have been here um i appreciate your enthusiasm and your support of chef aj and your desire to like constantly want to be learning new information about how to integrate a more plant focused approach into your lifestyle. Um, I feel like I've made probably millions of decisions in my life over the course of the last 40 years. And there have been a few decisions that stand out at the very, very, very top of, you know, my, what I consider to be good decisions. Number one, marrying my wife, Kylie Buckner, probably the best decision I ever made. Number two, getting two adorable cats. One of the best decisions I ever made that she made for me. Number three, becoming a plant-based eater without question. One of the best decisions I ever made. This fundamentally changed how my body operates, my requirements for insulin, my ability to be active, um, the amount of inflammation inside of my muscle tissue, the way that my mind works, the way that uh, I think about problems in this world and the ability to help other people as well. So if you're not eating a plant-based diet right now and are considering it, by all means, please do it. I strongly encourage you to do it. And if you are eating a plant-based diet and are always trying to find ways to optimize it, then I commend you for your approach because plant-based nutrition in my mind is truly the gift that keeps on giving. And it never, ever, ever stops giving you good results. And uh, you know, if you're considering doing it, by all means, you can absolutely do it and you can thrive. I love what you said. We're going to have to start calling you Cyrus Buzz Lightyear. Metabolism, gone. <laughs> I don't know if you answered the salt question. What was the question? What do you think about salt? What do I think about salt? Uh, okay, on the totem pole of things that matter in this world, salt kind of matters. It's pretty low on the totem pole, in my professional opinion. Okay, so we, I've been hammering home this idea that like the total amount of saturated fat in your diet is important. The total amount of animal products in your diet is important. The total amount of calories in your diet is important. Your body weight is important. All those things are the very top of that totem pole. So pay attention to those variables first. 
as you begin to optimize your lifestyle, then start to pay attention to your salt intake. Okay. So if you have a little bit of salt in your diet right now, don't beat yourself up. It's fine. It's not a big deal. But over the course of time, do recognize that the amount of salt in your diet is going to affect you in multiple ways. Number one, it can increase your risk for hypertension. There's no question. It can increase your blood pressure. We know this without a shadow of a doubt. Number two, what most people don't recognize is that when there's salt in your diet, you become hungrier. There's actually some research out of NASA that's actually demonstrated that astronauts who consume a little bit more salt in their food eat more calories. And Everybody it's very costly. I, I can send you that article about how it, it contributes to passive overconsumption, 11% more calories. I find that that's the only thing that really makes me overeat is, is, is fat and salt. And if I don't yeah. eat them, I, I can eat whatever I want. Okay. Yeah. So you've, you've, you've quantified 11% of passive over, uh, overconsumption of calories and you can feel it. You've, you've been there. I, I can feel it as well. Sometimes when I go out to eat and I put a little bit of salt in or they, they put salt in my food, I eat it. And I'm like, why do I want to eat more food? It's weird. Right. It is. Weird. It's so weird. Like I just can't stop eating. It's like, Ooh, this. like I eat and I think this is very good when I eat salt. Ooh, this is really good. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, absolutely true. So in the general scheme of things, I'm, I don't want to say salt doesn't matter. Salt matters. Pay attention to salt, but pay attention to salt like fifth or sixth or seventh on your list of priorities and pay attention to all the other things that we've been talking about for the last two hours as you're, you're the top on your priority list. Oh, okay. I was going to let you go, but now I, have, I saw this question from my yeah. type one and a half ever been reversed if already on whole food plant-based and dialysis and insulin. Okay. So the question is, can you reverse type 1.5 diabetes? Is that something you want to pay attention to? Here's the thing. Don't try and reverse type 1.5 diabetes. It is not doable from everything I know, from everything I've studied, from all the people I've talked with and all the biochemistry I've gone through. Type one and 1.5 are autoimmune flavors of diabetes. Autoimmune diabetes cannot be, re re uh, cannot be reversed. There's no science to back up the idea that you can reverse an autoimmune version of diabetes. If you're living with gestational diabetes, or prediabetes or type two diabetes, you can reverse those. The goal of living with type 1.5 diabetes is not to reverse it. The goal is to utilize insulin, absolutely inject insulin, but use the smallest amount of insulin necessary to consume the largest amount of carbohydrate necessary. I'll say that one more time. The goal with type 1.5, which is the same as the goal with type one, to use the smallest amount of insulin necessary to consume the largest amount of carbohydrate uh, possible while keeping your blood glucose nice and controlled. If you can do that, then you are optimizing your insulin sensitivity and you are able to reduce your risk for the development of other chronic diseases as well. Great, and did you mention caffeine where you stand? Caffeine, um, I'm indifferent to caffeine. I've kind of flip-flopped on both of them. We actually took a look at a lot of the research to try and determine if caffeine affects your blood glucose values. And it does, it can, it can definitely, raise your blood glucose values. But again, on the totem pole of things that matter, caffeine's way down there, it's below salt. So if you have a little bit of caffeine in your diet, it's not a big deal. I wouldn't worry about it. Also the type of caffeine matters, the way that you filter your coffee matters, whether you're getting caffeine from green tea or you're getting it from coffee beans matters. But again, that's a, that's a subject for a whole different talk altogether. All I'm saying right now is if you got a little bit of caffeine in your diet, don't sweat it, don't beat yourself up. A little bit of caffeine here and there is not going to, you know, matter significantly. And uh, well, major and minor thing. Start with the triage and start with the most important: the animal protein, the animal fat, that kind of stuff first. Always pay attention to those variables first, and then when the time is right, you can pay attention to your caffeine intake, and maybe you'll see a small difference in your blood glucose and or, uh, you know. Yeah. And also, it depends. Energy. You know, I always tell people do the least restrictive version of this plant-based diet that will get them the results they seek. If they have the results, then maybe they have a little more wiggle room. Everybody's going to be a little bit different. When it that's comes. a great way to think about it. Do the least restrictive thing that's going to get you the maximum results. That's a that's a brilliant way to think about it. I like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And uh, the reason salt makes you hungry is hungry, or is it's a powerful appetite stimulant. And you can test this yourself, guys. Eat something that that you can eat without salt, maybe some rice, for example, and notice how much you eat on a given day when you're hungry, then put soy sauce on it. You're going to eat way more. I promise you. I, <laughs> experiment. I have done it. Yeah. 
Oh, Cyrus, you are the best. And I hope you'll come back, either you and or Robbie, uh, the rest of the next six days to introduce the guests that I don't know as well. And uh, it's just been wonderful getting to know you, being your friend. And guys, if you haven't read this New York Times bestselling book, it's a wonderful book and it's a wonderful program. And Cyrus and Robbie are wonderful people. What does he feed his cats? They're not letting you go. So I'll just sit here. I'm just telling you right now, I've got something at four o'clock, so I can't go more than four. I know. I was going to say, I got something in seven minutes and I definitely okay. would like to eat a uh, Last question. This is no matter what the last question, because we have Robbie tomorrow. What do you feed your cats? Let's see if they'll come up here. Uh, what do I feed my cats? Uh, there is a, there's a company based out of San Francisco called Nom Nom. And Nom Nom is awesome because they make extremely high quality uh, cat food and dog food. And then they package it up into these little packets and then they send it to your house. And um, we chose to go with Nom Nom as opposed to getting food from the grocery store or actually like preparing meat in our house because the food from the grocery store is disgusting and the meat we would prefer not to prepare in our house. So they give you these little packets. You just open the packet up and you feed it to them. It's got chicken. It's got a little bit of pumpkin in them, which is actually good for cats because it helps give a little bit of fiber for that digestive system. And then it has a couple other ingredients, which are all like culinary grade. But in addition to that, our cats love eating cauliflower and broccoli. So we'll make some cauliflower and broccoli and the two of them will run over to the kitchen and they'll sit on the countertops and they'll like wiggle their tails because they're so excited. So we put small amounts of that to mix in with a sort of like carnivorous pulp that they get from Nom Nom. And, um, and then another thing that they absolutely love too is nutritional yeast. So we'll sprinkle their food with a nutritional yeast and they will just devour everything, anything that has nooch on it. So they're is, adorable. Is Nom Nom, N-O-M, N-O-M, Nom Nom? Like N-O-M, that. N-O-M. That's exactly right. Okay. That's great. Well, yeah. thank you so much. And guys, we've got Robbie tomorrow. So if anything wasn't answered today, Robbie will show you that you can also manage your diabetes, master your diabetes, eating fruit, the whole fruit, and nothing but the whole fruit. Thank you so much, Cyrus. You rock. Thank you, Chef AJ. And thank you all for participating. This has been really fun. Okay. Come back tomorrow for day two of Master.